All right. Welcome, everyone, to our community live stream. Um, this week, we don't have much uh, to report on the SEMF side, uh, just to say that we are busy at work organizing the summer school. So uh, I guess that's enough news. Uh, quite uh, quite an exciting time. Lots of uh, theory right. crafting. Welcome, everyone, to our community live stream. Oh, oh, oh. Um, this uh, week, we don't have much uh, to report on the SEMF side, uh, just uh, to say that we are I have, I have my own busy audio. at work organizing <laughs> the summer school. Terrible. So, OK, sorry about that. Um, Apologies, uh, I was just doubling my audio for a second. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, we are busy at work with the summer school. Um, lots of theory crafting and, and sort of organizational principles being discussed on how to de decide exactly on the contents and the format of the summer school. So um, we don't have anything to show yet, but uh, all I can say is that it's looking pretty interesting and much more, uh, much more structured, much more uh, cohesive than last year. So it can only be an improvement. So we look forward uh, to that. Um, on uh, our community activity, well, of course, we are here gathered uh, to discuss the end of science, it seems. Uh, but uh, remember that this is part of our current uh, biweekly cycles. Uh, we are um, deciding on a topic or a, or a range of topics, and then we cover them uh, every two weeks. Now, uh, the next one is decided to be uh, about uh, dimensionality and data. So uh, Liubov, who has been in the community a few times already, will actually be visiting the same flat in Madrid. Um, uh, we, we're going to be working together as part of uh, my collaboration uh, with her in sort of the research uh, directions. Um, but uh, we are going to be focusing on this idea of uh, data dimensionality reduction and, and, and so on. So if you're interested in that, uh, the next couple of weeks are the focus for, for that topic. Um, and other than that, um, I don't have anything else to say, but um, thanks to everyone who enjoyed, uh, who joined in the, in the conversations this last couple of weeks. It's been great to see how lively the community uh, has, has been sort of interacting lately. Um, and without further ado, I think we can actually move to the discussion, which is, I think, the main uh, attraction of, of, of this of this event now uh if there are any questions uh on on the zoom chat sorry on the youtube chat unfortunately given that i'm not in the same base i don't have my second screen available uh i will uh, encourage everyone who is watching to join the link uh and and follow up on the instructions to join the discord server and there you can find everything you can pose your questions you can uh, even vote on future uh, live stream topics and have uh, you know suggestions for other topics to to cover and of course uh, come to these live meetings and everyone who is here at some point was just watching on youtube or just heard of us indirectly so everyone is welcome um we we are excited to uh, get many new people by the way we have a few new uh members of the community we've had maybe around six or seven new new community members in the last few days so it's always good to see uh, influx of people and yeah as I say, unfortunately, I won't be able to monitor the, the YouTube chat today. Maybe Alvaro uh, could be monitoring, but I really don't know because it's uh, Easter and we are far away from the same base and it's a little bit logistically uncommon. But other, other than that, um, if um, by the way, if anyone here present has any questions or comments about SEMF more generally before we move on, move on to the meat of the question, uh, please go ahead and mention or ask or... Um, criticize or praise or whatever it might be. So I'm going to get this notification out of the way for a second. Right. OK, so let's uh, discuss about the limits of science, the end of science, um, what we even mean by this, uh, an important theme or subtopic that has been uh, sort of a focus of attention in the last what week or so has been this notion of truth of course animal at some point asked uh, about the, the notion of truth in i think the philosophy channel and since we've had a bit of a flurry of contributions uh, around that so um i don't know if maybe animal yourself you'd like to give some uh, prompt on what you meant by that question or what your intention was originally and then maybe everyone can react uh, more or less uh, representative of their positions as shown in the Discord channel. And other than that, we can evolve from there. Um, I guess uh, that 
we can organize the conversation around uh, this notion of truth first, but then second, I think we should address um, this more broader question of what are the limits of science? What is science even trying to do? And of course, we have had a, a, a bit of a, a clash with some people in our in our server that, that maybe held views that were not so orthodox, uh, to put it lightly. Um, and so it, it might be a good it might be a good space to um, discuss how to deal with with the conversations uh, with with you know different uh, um, different inclinations, dif different sensibilities, and you know things things around uh, you know what is the margin between uh, imagination and inspiration and and just uh, going over to pseudoscience or, or more harmful sort of ways of thinking. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this, these are the these were the, actual, the topics that actually motivated me to decide to have this particular topic for this biweekly theme. So uh, if you want, we can begin with a more abstract, more philosophical truth sort of question, and then we can move into sort of more practical and more down to earth question of uh, the actual limits of science and how to uh, what, what does it mean to be scientific or what is the scientific method at large and think that it needs some kind of updating or what does it mean exactly and so on. So maybe Anmol, you can prime us and uh, then- Okay, uh, so uh, is it too noisy in the background or is it fine? No, I think we can hear you fine. It's fine, okay. Yeah, so in the philosophy channel, I started with the notion of truth as uh, at first I was thinking it in form of linguistics in the sense that what do we consider sensible? Like what parameters do we use to localize on a particular value in lieu of others? So how do we say this is not like right, this is right? So yeah, so uh, I, I was thinking about it. So the definition that I came up with was that uh, truth can be defined very philosophically uh, in the sense that we tend to, in, in a more practical manner, we tend to define it uh, in a framework consistency manner. So for instance, if I have a body of work that is, for in, in instance, in mainstream physics, if I have some laws, then I would be using those as foundations for production of new knowledge. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't conduct an experiment that is independent from those foundations, foundational truths, you can say. So in that, so those assumed knowledge then becomes the guide for the new truth. So in that sense, I came up with this definition of a polarizer. A polarizer is anything that helps us discriminate between multiple independent values. So it gives a sort of a ranking or preference. Yeah, so sort of like that. So anything that localizes onto a single value uh, under some polarizer can be called truth. So that was where we started. And then I think like there were some other, other, other discussion. And as far as the limits of science, uh, that was with regards to whether this methodology is necessarily uh, complete in terms of finding all truths that can be found uh, if we were to go by this definition or are there any methods that we can come up with uh, going forward perhaps like things that cannot be testable by science due to its very uh, nature of finding information for instance yeah um, James feel free to unmute yourself um, uh, I think yeah. we, we, so, uh... I liked the, the, the concept of the definition there, just to nitpick a little bit. So you mentioned that um, with the establishment of laws, you can use that to determine new truth, but um, that was an adjective, right? So what? how would you differentiate between new truth and old truth? And is old truth not just the decision to choose the rules with which you def decide truth? And then it becomes recursive because then what was the truth used to determine the rules? Uh, like, can you give me an example, for instance? Maybe. Yeah, so in other words, um, you said there was um, the rules determine, if, you, if we all decide on what rules to use, we, and we use that as the basis, the foundation, we can use that to determine new truth. So then what's the old truth? If that's new truth, then, then what's old, based on, based on that um, analogy? Ah, so I meant in the sense of like not replacing it. So the new truth isn't necessarily replacing it. It is more like it's building upon it. Like it's building upon what? Yeah. Uh, the Like for instance, we have some body of knowledge. So uh, I know that... Mm, okay, let's put this. Do you, do, you see, do you see the dilemma here? 
You pulled it no, out. No, no. Uh, like to me, it sounds like <laughs> okay. If I say I will uh, launch a rocket from here to Jupiter in five seconds, like what would you use to contradict this? The probability of this statement. You will probably go to historic events and will say like, look, these these are laws. You cannot do this based on this. You cannot just go out in a vacuum and say, oh, you can't do that because I don't feel like that should be able to. That should happen, right? So you would use those. Ex that existing information to contradict the value in my conjecture. Yeah, but it's not necessarily not true. You know, depending on who you are, you might be launching a rocket to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm trying to understand here exactly. So, I I have I mean my personal position with with regards to truth is very uncomfortable. I. I mean, th this terminology outside of Boolean algebra and computation, I find it very strange somehow um, uh, in the sense that maybe everything is true in some vague, uh, generic sense, an interesting sense or nothing is or something. I don't know. But um, so I, I was I, I think it might be interesting, uh, Anmol, uh, or anyone for that matter, who, who has truth as more of a guiding concept that it's maybe it's used in daily life and practical you know situations uh that you can explain to us or you can relay what kind of how it, how, how it feels like to to use truth as a as a practical concept uh because my position about it is that oh i know exactly what truth means in a in a boolean system or a computational system where i have like verification process and so on but outside of that i understand what the sort of fiction or analogy is for my understanding of the world but i beyond that i don't really see you know what is true what is not it's, it's more just process and so yeah please uh, enlighten us <laughs> I'm, I'm very curious to 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 hear from from your like lived experience of the concept of truth in some sense uh, so i think like uh, with this definition i was aiming more for the like not that truth exists but like truth can exist if you make it like there is some order that we can define in a given framework so which which may vary depending on the scope for instance if if i'm working with some tolerances so within those tolerances if something varies that isn't of concern to me but if my scope changes then those tolerances might become big enough for them themselves to be a discriminator for example, if if I want some specification uh, of an instrument, I want it exactly. I, I want it around five meters. So I do not care if you can take a vernier caliper and say, oh, this is like one nanometer off or something, because those tolerances aren't relevant to the scope that I am working in. So in that with with that, uh, you can say that those errors are in the random domain. Like they aren't relevant to me. So the truth value of it is no different to if it were exactly five meter, if it were like a couple of nanometers, even micrometers above it or below it, that isn't, they, those are equivalent truths with respect to my requirement. If, if you were to define it that way in the polarizer sense. But if, if my tolerances were like really low, then I would say, oh, this, like, this is one nanometer off. This is better than that, which is three or four nanometers off. Okay. So now I have a discriminator. So I see a point here about metrology and measurement. So maybe, so I think that that has it deserve its own sort of sub conversations. Or maybe let's hear from Alex, Elena, Fotis, and and, and see if we can stay. Because if we land into metrology, I think we're going to get into some sort of fine, 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 finite details of of uh, minutia that is maybe not so interesting. But let's hear from from everyone else and see what what we get. Hi, so so. I I yeah, I raise my hand because I have to finally answer to very brief briefly to you you give me one barely do like a face it's barely no no not even not, and what what about now no I mean it's yeah. barely understandable yeah. okay okay then then I would write yeah. okay yeah saying saying on Discord then someone can relate. Yeah, I think uh, we should go back to our main theme with the limits of science and try to contact to see like 
to not go into a philosophical uh, uh, discussion on truth and its definition, which is it, it can get uh, very abstract very quickly. Uh, and because of its vagueness, uh, if we go, as you, Carlos, said, outside of um, a purely logical definition of truth as Boolean, as like uh, one or zero, basically, uh, which can be well articulated and well defined, uh, we stumble across, we open the Pandora's box because, like, <laughs> truth, truthfulness, a very, um, very ideal notions, uh, all of that can be has been a subject of debate for years and we are still that it, it is it is still very fuzzy so I, i'd say let, let's relate it to science let's relate um let's relate to how truth um as a value as as a as an epistemic value relates mm -hmm. to uh, to scientific knowledge production yeah uh, i think uh, and so what notion of well You, you also asked another interesting, very important question, which is, is, is the notion of truth even useful that to speak about when we speak about science? Um, so um, I guess we can start from here. I guess we can start from, okay, um, when, we have, when we speak of scientific truth, when we speak, uh, do we speak of explanations? Do we speak of um, something uh, correlating to reality? Uh, our own, you know, models for relating to reality, or we will speak of something else. Uh, and I'll uh, pass the ball to James. He has an yeah. insight now. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's very good to uh, differentiate truth and what we're trying to achieve here, um, which is more about like the, the scientific endeavor. Um, but the way you've just framed that now could actually connect with my definition of how I like to think about truth. And ultimately, it boils down to agreement uh, between various parties. So we, if we agree, then we can both agree that this thing is true, then that is the definition of truth. It's as simple as that. Facts can contradict what we decide to be true. It doesn't make it untrue. It just means that there's observations that are currently in contradiction of what we've decided is the truth. So in terms of science, the way one could think about it is that there's a group of people who have a set belief of what they deem to be true. And that boundary with which in they operate and the rules or the, the truths that they hold as um, axiomatic can help determine um, new truth or facts or scientific endeavor based on the foundations of the truths that they hold as scientists. So if you have a separate group that, you know, maybe do um, witchcraft, for example, as like the quintessential counterexample, um, they have their set of truths and the underlying difference um, of which truths they agree on are different to the scientists. But they're going to generate their own truths and they're going to go off and make all kinds of assumptions and observations and factual, um, you know, what they hold as facts based on their truths. Um, the difference is what group do you belong to i think maybe that's one one way to think about it uh, so truth is basically a notion that is uh inherently social inherently interpersonal in that regard it has to do it's with direction hmm? yeah it's like it's like a direction it's a goal and the facts are kind of like the steps along the way but we agree we're heading in this direction and hmm. the more facts you can build up towards it almost like the closer away or the further away you are from truth yeah I, w I would just add to yeah. that. The, I, I would add to that that um, I'm glad that James that you mentioned this because I I'm normally the one to bring up the sort of communicational network uh, evolutionary sometimes even approach to to these notions in mathematics and I mean at the end of the day in, truth is very deeply connected to the sort of foundations of mathematics and you know all, all the all the formal way of operating and so on um, and I I always think that mathematics is nothing but this uh, sublimed version of communication that that many beings do, not just humans. Um, and in the case of truth in particular, it might be a particularly refined aspect of, of that process. Um, and well, it's formalism, maybe. Maybe that's, maybe that's the quintessential difference, is the, the use of a technology, a social technology called formalism. 
And that might be the differentiator between a scientific endeavor versus one that is not based on these rules of formalism. Well, I, I think that the, the distinction is more about uh, if we are contrasting here uh, a more empirical tradition and a more spiritual tradition or something like that. I think that the contrast really is in the method when it comes to the verification, because the formal, the formal part can be both symbolic, can be both grammatical in some sense, can be self-consistent, and it can have all those properties. I, I mean, you know, mathematics for its own sake is indistinguishable from just some spirituality, right? Like, I mean, just some internal logic, some rules, but it's really yeah. when it gets in conversation with the distributed community that is experiencing a common world, or, or at least in some picture, right? Um, that that becomes more than just a sort of a spiritual belief, right? Um, because otherwise, the, the only criterion really is whether what feels right, what feels, you know, correct or true, you know, even in this context. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think that's that's the crucial difference, and uh, and and you know, not to accelerate the conversation into the how to talk to these different uh, cliques or tribes, uh, intellectual tribes uh, nowadays, but. Uh, I think that the main way to approach these kinds of questions is precisely by by saying, well, there's a range of uh, experiences that you can, at the end of the day, you can firsthand um, corroborate, and and you see that there's this chain of assumptions or chain of fictions that are believable because of each each one of them has a firsthand very verification process or at least a virtual one, right? And and you can build this sort of networks of um, virtual verification that although you are absolutely not doing in practice, you, you imagine that you could do. And so it's a, it's a very different position from saying, oh, I just saw, you know, whatever, these patterns in, in some uh, spiritual realm that descended from the higher dimension and, and now I have infused with it. Like this gives you a reliable or in principle operational approach to, to saying, oh, this statement or this particular truth for this context uh, has this consequence of, a, of an operation. And it's pre pretty much what you said, James. Yeah. <laughs> It's Can a, I ask a, a dumb yes. question there? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just going to interject. Uh, you kind of, you guys kind of just like synergize and rolled onto each other. Like, so what I'm not really following is that you mentioned verification. I would like to, uh, let's mm -hmm. say, let's say th there are some different um, pockets of um, uh, understanding uh, what what and form for some somehow formulating a way towards what they what these pockets happen to consider to be the vision the truth the direction or whatever and i think what you mentioned there the verification you said it's kind of like a key point there but then i'm wondering what you consider verification how can it, how can it apply between different pockets like isn't that just a, something that comes from your pocket does that make sense? Or how yeah. are you approaching this verification thing that is a meta I, I, that you yeah. can apply to? Yeah. Am I making okay. sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I am I am thinking of verification uh, as a purely individual sort of node level uh, phenomenon in some sense. Like you can have distributed consensus, distributed um, effects and so on. But verification, in my opinion, really boils down to an individual uh, experience and of course just verification is incomplete and that's why we need large numbers statistics you know network effects and so on but but verification at the end of the day i mean in my humble understanding of this is really your cognitive resonance with the thing that you have at hand it's like you know that's true it feels right you know i, I was told there was a tiger behind that that tree and i looked and it, it was it's like okay it was true that there was a tiger behind a tree behind a tree because i experienced something that I, I can connect in a positive way, right? It's it's uh, sometimes when I, I don't know, maybe this is too, too uh, esoteric to mention here, but sometimes when I'm looking in my pocket in the dark or something, or I put my bag, my hand in the bag in the dark, and I'm just sort of like searching for an item, and I'm just sort of guessing shapes with my hand, right? I think of this concept in that moment because I'm thinking, yeah, I'm kind of like, I have this idea of what shapes I could encounter by just wiggling things around. And then sometimes, I get one and it's like, oh, that's not the one. Sometimes I get another one, ah, oh, that's the one. So what is that? It's just me wanting an object and trying to select it out from others. So I feel like the concept of Boolean truth that we have enshrined and sort of crystallized in this formal way is in some sense, some sense an extension and a sort of a formalization of this natural process that we have of like engaging with direct experiences that, that feels like, okay, yeah, that was, that, that checks. Like it feels like, yeah. We are satisfied. 
in some sense. It's like I feel almost like it's demoting the the status that that is had philosophically, but at the same time, I don't really have a better candidate to replace it because it, where where could it be coming from other than your system is somehow adapting and you have this idea of sort of reward and pain or just the satisfaction and goal oriented behavior that is frustrated or accomplished. And, you know, these these kinds of things seem to be very much tied to the fact of how we behave as as beings in the world more than intrinsic properties of things. And by the way, I will just mention here for contrast that, you know, this idea that there's true and false and there's some, some kind of binary nature to it, in my opinion, is clearly not very relevant in a for, at a formal level because there's nothing stopping you from having multivalued logics that, that have precise formal behaviors that just have, you know, red, blue, and green values of truth. And none of them is false or true, or it's just, you know, three or four or more. And um, you can do computation just the same way. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. Um, I think our preference for that binariness of, of truth values really comes down to our subjective experience of how we engage with things. Uh, I mean, I am very ready to be proven wrong and to be changed my mind because this is just an intuition and I've never found a better a candidate for for what is the source of booleanity in the world somehow uh, but uh yeah I'm, I'm curious to hear what you guys have to how, how you think so about like uh, yeah I'm for, a, for the verification uh, process uh i personally like to think of it uh in terms of faculties of discrimination so like the scope of it whether individual scope or system scope depends on whether the individual components of that group share the same faculties of discrimination so for instance, uh, if if we have a bunch of blind people and a bunch of people who do have vision, and now we need to communicate the concept of vision to them, you can maybe explain it to them in great detail. They might make sense, try to make sense of it, but at the end of the day, they cannot gain the information from direct experience without actually possessing that faculty of discrimination. That is yeah. to say, you can, so insofar as you can uh, create the same explanation, create anything that is associated to it, but that is not it, you can you can basically trick them into thinking that something is made up of some color even when it is not. So you cannot really identify a particular value of truth when there is some faculty of discrimination that is a necessity to arrive at it. So for instance, if I have to, without a heat signature uh, or some other maybe surface level, basically anything that can be derived from other faculties, so I'm assuming a purely vision-based faculty that can identify that thing, so if I have a red color and blue color on screen, it is impossible for me to guess that correctly over multiple trials if I do not possess that faculty of discrimination. That is something that you cannot fake. So in that sense, I see that you can say like provided this faculty, this has to be like, yeah. And like uh, the scope uh, can ch change like, so the scope can be in terms of individual or systems level or the scope can be temporal. So what is true to me today would not be true to me tomorrow based on new information that I've gathered since then. So yeah, something like that. Uh, go on, Pina. I think you're saying something. Um, maybe I'm a bit slow, but I didn't get the connection to the faculty, the existing of certain faculties and um, discriminator being dependent on it. And that's that to verification process. Okay, so like are you saying are you saying uh -huh. you cannot verify something unless you have certain faculties? <laughs> Is it that simplistic, or what? What, what are what are we saying? Yeah, I mean, like, uh, if you were to challenge me, for instance, you you'd say, oh, like, can you can you prove the existence of red as opposed to blue? Then I have to have that faculty of discrimination between red and blue that is provided to me by vision. That yeah. is something that I cannot identify without it. So there's think, a backdrop yeah. of it, like a fundamental. Right. Uh, is it is it is it right to 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 put it here, Almo, uh, to characterize your position that you're essentially saying that you need this direct uh, channels of experience to do verification? Because what you're saying that this boils down to some individual experience or firsthand um, sensory experience at the end of the day, right? Yeah, I mean, like any polarizer. So if two individuals come to some string of, uh, I don't know, like. Uh, linked elements that could otherwise not be captured by any other polarizer, then that means there must be a unique polarizer at play. My point is that 
any information like all of it should not be captured by other polarizers than the one that they that they claim to have so in the case, case of vision even though uh, like when i am blind it is impossible for me to capture all information associated with it unless i have the capability of seeing things so so in that sense like if there's some faculty that we do not possess ex- whether that be experiential or any other and then some guy claims to possess i mean of course uh, unless there are at least two people it would be impossible for to for us uh, to establish the truth of it but assuming that there are two parties and they claim to have the same faculty two individuals or parties that claim to have the same faculty and then we perhaps split them into two rooms uh, provide them with the necessary stimulus that uh, attempts to verify that faculty and then we come up with information that otherwise could not be explained by existing faculties that we do know that means that there must be some other faculty that counts for that extra information that is consistent between the two groups uh, sorry i'm not, i think i think here is what might be confusing people is that is that you're basing this on this notion of a polarizer which is uh, not very common to our own you know mental models Mm. Yeah. So I think it is it is a very technical notion to based on this commonality of this cognitive uh mm-hmm. it is it is cognitive although in in the in the um, in its foundations, right? Uh it is about sharing a cognitive mode in a way yeah i i think like yeah i am assuming that the truth here is knowable like there's no unknowable truths here okay so it's all right all right danny yeah i just wanted to uh give you like alexis and elena's uh, message cuz they shared it through the um discord channel so alex uh, says um, truth on the goal science as high contrast is not i think a complete definition during all history of science when we may approach its limits and it's wise to integrate inherent uncertainty inside a paradigm an indirect but essential connection to this is that a scientific paradigm must assume different perspectives when it cannot absolutely decide between several alternatives more than a limitation this is just how science act always works and then elena says uh, that another question might be in what context we discuss the limits of science uh which as Fodis puts requires asking for the purpose of science of course finding truth some notion of it but explaining it persuading others of it integrating perspectives in it and yeah that's uh their contribution just so in case you want to discuss it now mm-hmm. so it it seems so uh, as uh we have like we have some commonalities some divergences in terms of like or how we define truth here it seems like the fact that it is relational and social and requires this aspect of um this network level thinking is behind our notions that, that it is processual and it is a kind of a process that leads to a certain goal or to a certain attractor point is also quite similar but this aspect of like i think the thing that where the some divergence is in terms of like oh is this a process that goes to a single point or is it something that is that produces different ones uh and then we have like some dynamics between these different perspectives um so i think this is something that is be- that sits behind here like this this um this comments i think hmm. maybe i can uh, just make a um a statement here and that's to be cautious of um claiming truth and its relationship to science um perhaps like as important as truth is maybe the the question that we're trying to answer here is what are the limits of science you know and to claim that um science is truth or trying to define truth before you actually thought more about its relationship to, to science um could could do real to it so perhaps like thinking um to come back to truth maybe and the notions of it and the definitions of it after first thinking a little bit about the topic of science itself and maybe what the limitations are and why 
why is it the case that somebody else can believe something unscientific to be true? Maybe after first like putting yourself in the shoes of someone that thinks that there's certain scientific principles that are maybe untrue. Hmm. I mean, like the, the basic um, concept there is the, like if I would say what, what are some of the limits of science? And I would say sometimes what happens in the, in the scientific endeavor is that you can um, build up so many facts that it can uh, limit your potential um, input or like what you would deem to be valid or, or um, where you would even start to look at things. And that can, that can, that can kind of like maybe narrow the scope of um, things that could inform what is more true. Um, so in other words, you know, if, if there's, uh, actually there's, there's a great, here's, here's a great story for you. I won't take too much time on this, but, uh, Richard Feynman had this, had this perfect example, um, that, that might help with this. And he was talking about the, the Mayans and he was saying that there were these Mayan astronomers who could very accurately predict when solar eclipses would happen over time. And they had a system to do this based on charts and an idea of the of the world and how the planets orbited each other and that kind of thing and they could predict it like pretty accurately but um a young mind um who you know had a no training in, in science they'd say had a completely different notion about these balls spinning around each other in space and he kind of like had this feeling that if the balls um, crossed each other at a certain point it would create an eclipse so he would go to the, the Mayan astronomers and say, look, I've got this idea of how these balls could explain everything. They'll be like, oh, that's very interesting. So how accurately can this theory predict the eclipses? And his response would be like, well, it actually can't predict any eclipses yet. You know, I'm still working on it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the, the facts or the predictive nature. And then the astronomers would naturally be like, okay, well, nice theory, but, you know, we, we, we're, we're not going to waste our time on on this uh, on this notion, because our thing is more is more fact fact based, you could say. Um, meanwhile, that premise or that um, outside of science view ended up being more truthful. So maybe that's a story with which we can think about um, the limits of science. Yeah, that's that's certainly one. Um, I want to relay some some comments here. So Alvaro actually uh, made a comment here um, replying to um, the, your definition, James's definition of truth says, um, I guess Alor's point on, on truth is, I would say that the notion of truth in practice outside of formal systems, etc., and hence in science might may seem a, a bit obscure and ambiguous, but, it, but it's generally equivalent to the notion of invariance in measurement, which is a much clearer notion. Um, that measurement might be what you see uh, other people saying and thus connecting with the agreement perspective. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I would I would add just briefly to that that um, and also to reply to Alex's comment on uh, uh, the, sort of the pleasure and the happiness measure of truth and so on. Like my my point about um, the reward or the cognitive consonance of origins of truth is, is more the direct uh, in the, the direct experience of that one has with 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 the systems and and of course uh, if it comes down to metrology if it comes down to this idea of measurement um, one has to really break down what it means to measure something in the first place right? and of course we are encultured uh, to have to be in a metrological civilization I mean we've been metrological for what now 20,000 years or something as a as a, as, a, as a species, right? We, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we've been talking about um, the properties of objects, right? We've been saying this object is heavy. Our, our language reflects this kind of uh, this kind of way of uh, thinking, right? This this object is heavy, or this uh, whatever uh, this river is long, and, and so on. Uh, but when you think about metrology and how we actually measure stuff, and you go down to the foundations of metrology, you realize that Metrology is only a relational construction. There's no, there's no sense in which. Um, so metrology is only a way in which uh, an individual can.
can get some clearly communicable information about some process out in the world. And typically the process is also under control in the sense that you have some maybe discretized uh, algorithm or something like that. Um, so for example, if you think about the definition of meter or you know the, de the notion of length in, in the world, it all boils down to comparing to comparing side by side objects and you can't escape it. it it's, it's kind of funny that, you know, we define meter as some kind of mm -hmm. fraction or multiple of uh, an atomic radius and all this, uh, you know, speed of light and indirect and all very fancy stuff. But actually all that is connected to the fact that we, we, we are, we have built our chain of, uh, of imagined experiments that all boil down to going out in the world, taking two objects and just, you know, glancing, at whether they are the same length or not, or they are, you know, like overlapping or not. And these, these kinds of completely firsthand, intuitive, uh, kind of uh, big mesoscale human experiences, right? So, um, so I think that to me opens, uh, sort of opens up the, the diversity of approaches to truth. And, and when people uh, sort of circling back to the usefulness of the notion, I think historically the, the concept of truth, you know, going back, I don't know, to Plato or something where you have the, you know, the cave and the shadows and, you know, this idea of maybe this is a fiction or I'm not accessing the, the, the true component of reality, but there's an, a deeper, uh, deeper layer of reality that has a, a more faithful representation of the actual thing and so on. I think it's tightly connected to the fact that, as we mentioned, truth is socially defined, right? It's, it's at the end of the day, it's a language game where you can imagine lying, right? You can imagine making a statement that does not match with what the statement originally was formed for, right? Like you can imagine just you saw a yellow car and you say, actually, I saw a red car. And you can say just the same as if you would have seen a red one, right? So that possibility evolutionarily even just creates the creates the fork in which people need to be actively sort of uh, proactively engaging with this idea of, of theory of mind and this idea of predictive behavior and so on and i think it just by being such a sort of theory of mind driven species we have built this massive tradition this massive culture around language and around counterfactuals and around truth that putting truth as a as a driving value it turns out to be quite efficient. It turns out to be, you know, a lot of people even in the Renaissance were in Europe or, you know, in the in the um, uh, Islamic golden age in the in the 12th century or something, you know, in all these areas, people were explicitly driven by this idea that they were unveiling. In their words, they might be saying we are unveiling the work of God or the ultimate creators, whatever, whatever it is, but they do have this sense of unveiling something or, you know, uh, pulling up the veil of reality and seeing the things that, for what they truly are, and and I think you know we all we all experience that to some degree, right? Like I, I feel like when you know when you set yourself a problem and you begin working on it, it's like hmm, what is this? Or when you're in a creative uh, in a creative project and you're like ah, I think there is a solution here to combine these elements in this particular way. This idea of exploration and and it has that component of, of discovery and, and finding the, uh, the actual thing in the end and so on. So I feel like um, the, the status that truth has, has had philosophically is a little bit undue, but it's nonetheless very justified because uh, it, it's extremely powerful. I mean, it's, it's almost like you cannot imagine people going over you know, to the other side of the globe without the promise of there being something you know, amazing or creating new commercial route, so whatever it is that they had in their minds, so, you know, us going to Mars because we're, we're amazing or, and we want to go there or things like that, right? Like you need some kind of drive that is that is pseudo-religious almost that, that drives you somewhere. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that you forget what the process was like. And when you actually analyze the process, you realize that, in fact, you don't need to believe in God to actually follow Leibniz and see how he's referring to the existence of God as the foundation for many things. I mean, because Leibniz was a great thinker and regardless of how obsessed he was with, with, with God and whatnot, or similarly Newton and God and alchemy and all that stuff, right? So there were very good discovery and rational processes in, in these traditions, but nonetheless, uh, we, 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 can, we can just completely disentangle it from, from that because we have this meta process of verification with observations and all, all that kind of stuff right so it's it's a sort of a self-correcting adaptive system that is distributed 
even though it's enacted at an individual level, it only manifests when the network effects uh, take over, right? So over time, which I think is a very important criteria there. Um, and if we just go a little bit on about this feeling of truth um, as, as a proxy for what's good and bad, um, it seems like science over time, over a long enough time now, let's say hundreds of years or since the enlightenment has given us a feeling that if you, if you use the scientific way, our lives will improve and that has a good feeling. But over a shorter time period, you know, you could choose to believe some, um, you know, like local uh, cult, for example, and they can give you a lot of good feelings. Like you can go there, you've got community, you've got people saying, you know, doing like activities and it can, it can produce a lot of feelings and you could go with that truth for, for how you feel about it. But over a decade or two, the chance of that cult still um, being net positive on your feelings is very low. And over hundreds of years, there's a very unlikely that it's going to still exist. So that, that's maybe how you can tie this like emotional concept of um, feeling of, of what drives truth in feeling good and evolutionarily what feels good hopefully is like going to keep the species alive um, to how science has benefited that and how science has seems to be one of the, the better truths out there maybe. But the, this, but doesn't that like change from again, you, so you mentioned time scale there from like short, mm -hmm. very local to much more longer term. By the way, are you intentionally blurry? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I need to, I need to. Uh, You're not intentionally it. blurry. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Just making okay, um, outrageous comments and staying anonymous. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe. Oh, so you mentioned the local, look, the temporal scale, but then the, I would wonder like this, well, obviously it's also it's kind of an embodied temporal scale. Like, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, also trying to formulate what I was going to say. So this feel, sense of feeling, like something feeling right within the uh, time scale of our individual lives, let's say, versus something feeling feeling right or better, whatever, um, in a more consistent and a longer term thing. How can you convince, uh, or if that's even a goal, um, maybe, um, so I'm not assuming anything, I'm just going with the limited language that I have. Like, how do you, like, mm, yeah, uh, which one is over which one? You, you, like you can't like, not every not 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 even myself maybe. I can't know what will be the good thing. You know, like how's that prediction coming to play? Yeah, then? I, I think like what's the unit of measurement here? So if we take yeah. a, a single person's unit of measurement, um, they have their brain that's only in existence for their lifetime. But we have education. We have textbooks about the benefits of science. We have YouTube videos, so you just get you get exposed to the history and and the time scale of a longer time period based on. on you do, but can I yeah. mention one thing there? Because I think maybe this ties into the, at least maybe my currently confused perception of the limits of science. Like we are saying, like yes, there's this accumulated knowledge that will uh, enable you to get over your limited temporal existence and uh, whatever. But like, I'm not exactly sure if anything that is out there is actually translating into an embodied a, a perception of that good feeling. Like, I don't know if it's like, just because there are enough information out there, there's like, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is actually how it is going right now. There's just so much more a, stuff, you know what I mean? I can give you an easy example. I mean, okay. um, if you lived in a village with our toilets and then you moved into a city and you suddenly had like running water and like a sewage system, and you attributed that benefit to science, you would say, wow, science is good. I like this feeling. So well, it's about, uh, yeah, you can, you can break it down into small experiences. Wait, what is, uh, why, why does this feeling have to do with science? Yeah, I, I was uh, also like, yeah. at first I thought it was like, you were saying like, uh, you mentioned time scales, right? So I thought maybe it was the speed of convergence of truth that you were saying, mentioning. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like science, like I understood it as like that science, because of its methodology, takes longer, longer, but has a higher shelf life of that truth. Yes. As opposed to perhaps other more local values. But those local values can allow you to bypass what I call the temporal limitation of truth. Because 
when you exercise those parameters there are certain steps that you must uh, abide by if you want to categorize it as uh, for, like a part of science so that inherently limits what truths i can arrive at at this point in time because i have i have to respect that methodology if i don't then that is not science so i, I yeah. have i'm forced um, to switch groups in that instant in that sense can i interject here it's like i i think this notion that you've mentioned that this higher self value self uh, value of truth uh, or no, no i think we're talking about knowledge here to be or yeah something. um is is very important to as as an assumption uh, but i'd like to challenge this because and this is where we can get a little bit more concrete uh, with the conversation and how it relates to science rather than talking science in the general and I, and i think it would be good to see if, like our notions of like truth as it relates to science have to do with our own you know scientific background or uh, to our or the science we look at as the most you know um uh, representative because you know in, in in nutrition or in pharmacology or in social psychology uh, true like findings that you consider as like you know um that you would attach to them the notion of a scientific truth something that we know something that has been published it has been uh it, it has been in textbooks it was people use as basic theory um Let's say, for example, that's like uh, cholesterol in nutrition, like that cholesterol uh, in eggs is basically bad for your health. It, uh, it can clog your arteries if, uh, in the long run with a chronic consumption of, the, of uh, a lot of cholesterol. But, you know, this doesn't have, uh, this doesn't stay. Like it is something that has been, Uh, debunked very quickly and then then uh, then this process goes on very fast so uh so we have like a process we have like a circle of sorts which goes quite fast in a way and maybe we can say that there are circles that go like a bit slower and they're part of science uh and maybe this relates to the longer term and shorter than lo local scale mm. and like bigger scales because this it seems that science has this you know This, this methods that are being used uh, locally in very specific fields, um, um, such as like randomized control experiments, let's say now, which is the norm in pharmacology or this more empirical science that have this component of a sample and testing something against the sample. Uh, but then there's these processes of science that happen on biggest case, such as like paradigm shifts, uh, where you have like this whole, like, you don't have just like findings like local truths you have something that we you know the notion that uh the universe is deterministic and causes are linear and we can only i have isolated causality so you can only study how this specific substance interacts with this other one but if we have three there's a three body problem so we cannot do this because the universe is deterministic so this is there's a bigger scale one so we have like a difference Like, it seems that science can accommodate all of these, like, a lot of different um, uh, levels, basically, of speed. So, so I think, then, like, uh -huh. so, so maybe, like, uh, it, it would help to ask the question, like, what things can science not accommodate? And then... Like, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like this one too. Start, start yeah. yeah, that that yeah. was kind of like the the story of the the Mayan wannabe astronomer. Um, in the in this uh, that that's an example where it struggles to accommodate new theories that don't have much scientific backing already. I think that's probably one of the limitations. Oh, can I uh, say something here? Please. Yeah. Um, Well, oh, I'll first answer this question because uh, I think it's interesting. Like, and I was just thinking about that actually. Um, I think there are like some concepts which are not scientific, but nevertheless people attribute truth to them. So, uh, for example, the ineffability, the ineffability of 
I don't know, beauty or qualia or stuff like that mm -hmm. is something you cannot evaluate scientifically because it, it, they're defined as something that you cannot do anything with, really. You cannot share uh, it with the community. You cannot um, uh, manipulate it in, a, in any sense. Uh, so in that, in that sense, I, I would say that this kind of... Uh, concept or any kind of concept that's defining this in this way as ineffable uh lies within uh, with i mean outside the the scope of science it can be true in other senses i guess uh because there, there are many senses in which we can talk about truth uh, there's uh conventional truth as as uh, well this person's lying to me or this causes pleasure or pain or their mathematical senses of what's true, um, there's intersubjectivity as we discussed, and, and there's also the ideal of truth as uh, metaphysical truth that's out there. But I think ultimately uh, what we want to choose is a, a definition of truth that aligns with the kind of practices that we want to promote within science, depending on what we want. So we want to produce replicable operational operationalizable knowledge that gives us explanatory power and predictive power as well as uh, lead us to more potential pathways more knowledge uh, and doing this as uh, by assuming as least as possible uh, and um, at this I think goes uh, like on one of the, the I wanted to connect this to the idea of of integrating perspectives, uh, because I think that the, the idea of integration is necessary, uh, and it, it it's it, you just have to embrace it necessarily if you want to do science, uh, in the sense of even questions that are not necessarily uh, or concepts that are not necessarily physical, like uh, Zeus, for example. So does Zeus exist? Well, if you go to Mount Olympus, you're probably not going to see him in bed with Aphrodite, of course. But it does exist in a historical sense, in a psychological sense, uh, for the people who were living, uh, I don't know, like 2,000 years ago, or like maybe people who are, um, uh, you know, still believe in him or out of uh, whatever personal beliefs or whatever. Uh, in this sense, we can talk about this phenomenon we call Zeus. And um, so I, I guess uh, the one of the goals of science that we could uh kind of put out there just so we can discuss is um science as an integrative uh and hierarchical force of knowledge so we're not necessarily saying oh no no this is false and this is true but rather we're putting truths within their context we're making sense of um certain statements okay so this statement is not well, uh, Zeus doesn't exist. Well, it does exist in this sense, not in the sense that you can go out there, see him or whatever. Um, and uh, I also wanted to give you like uh, Elena's and Alex's contributions because uh, they're here written down and from like a while ago. So Elena said, uh, what are, she asked what are science's alternatives in order to have a list we may use later. And uh, Alex says that uh, answering to the uh, to James Wiles' uh, contribution about truth as feeling, he says that this would point towards pleasure and or happiness as a measure of truth, but I don't think this is the main case for modern science. What gives us predictive power and thus manipulation power, uh, reaching the moon for the first uh, time in history or curing polio is quite evident, for instance. Power for states and collectives, even without pleasure, is another big example. And then Elena and Alex uh, think that maybe abstract definitions of truth are less important than the practical limitations of science, since maybe they inform much more what is truth, uh, the scientific method, etc. at least a minimal definition. And, you know, so then other discussions. So, yeah, we basically feel like uh, continuing James points. That's what they're saying. And, yeah, so and you can discuss. <laughs> I'm done. So, so, like, from what I gathered, it, it, come, it came down to, like, one of them was, like, subjective judgment, so, which can be 
uh, said like, which, which which can be considered as a challenge for science to evaluate objectively. So I think that which lies outside its scope would be subjective judgment that cannot be reduced to objective parameters at the point of like studying it. So for instance, the concept of beauty, uh, if I cannot explain it entirely in that my observation doesn't match the prediction made by the model that I've created using science, then that means there is a there's some information that cannot be captured by that process. process. And another thing would be unfalsifiable claims. So I can claim, as you, as you said, like you gave the example of Zeus, so more generalized would be a concept of a god. There, there could, there, like, organized religion is, like, from a cultural standpoint, you could say it, as impactful or perhaps even more over the time span of humanity, perhaps the most important, one of the most important constructs of humanity in terms of its impact, social cultural impact. So in that sense, it created an environment which, based on an un unfalsifiable claim, that otherwise would not have been created. So like, there is a possibility that is unrealized without going that route. So I think in that sense, you could say, can we extract useful or actionable info from processes that are not necessarily scientific? So I think that becomes the next question. Like, does it limit us from realizing possibilities that are otherwise, yeah, limited by that scope of science? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think I think you can I, I think you can do a lot uh, by following assumptions uh, that are not falsifiable. Like like. Uh, you can you can pretty much work as a, a normal scientist by assuming that there's a world out there, but that such a thing is not something that you can prove within the scope of science. It's a met metaphysical assumption. Um, but uh, I suppose the the thing is more about um, reevaluating uh, these assumptions continuously, so so that you can work as Let's say you can work with them with the least amount of assumptions as possible, and uh, and yeah, like um, you, yeah, I, I mean, um, I, th I think God as as well um, in history has influenced uh, research and and philosophy and and so on. I don't think it's necessarily like a concept that works uh, independently of the human mind it is there it is in the human mind it, it is influencing our behavior and uh, that in itself is a, a is a scientific question it's a question that we could ask and try to answer hypothetically uh because it, it's it talks about human behavior it talks about neuroscience uh and all of these things are subject of uh scientific research yeah i think like there's a Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, this point about falsifiability is actually something that I will put my I will put my philosopher of science hats uh, now and say that it is you know it it is the Popperian um, uh, theory of science the philosophy of science that's is, that falsifiability is is like a, a central notion. But in fact, looking at history of science, and this is what like Thomas Kuhn did afterwards. Uh, uh, in, in various um, uh, uses, um, I can't remember exactly the 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 example here, but basically, you don't need notions to be falsifiable to work with them. And this is something that you see, like n now we're in an age where this has gone to the extreme because you have, you have like stuff like string theory, for example, which is by definition, non-falsifiable. Well, that's, I, I disagree that it's by definition non-falsifiable, but I agree with the oh, okay. sentiment nonetheless, um, because the, I mean, I agree, I agree with, with with the statement that we are in the extreme of uh, the sort of the realm of non-falsifiable um, domains, but I would within the, the, the scientific tradition. But that's if you look at the larger human endeavor, we might just be more or less in the same place as ever in some sense, right? Like, I mean, 
this idea of falsifiability is fairly novel and you know even for the history of science and the effective effective fi- false so falsifiability was always part of the uh, scientific process even when it was not called science right so when you had any kind of technical development any kind of cultural evolution that built on say uh, early machines or you know crop uh, systems and you know hunting techniques and whatever any any cultural evolution required some some degree of falsi- falsifiability because uh, it's really through fals- falsifiability that you get evolution of ideas in some sense right like i mean you can just you get ebb and flow of ideas nonetheless but evolution proper that adaptive evolution in some sense you only get by this um well falsification or call it uh, adapt or call it uh, selection or intellectual selection or some or some or some kind i mean what, what we've done in the in the recent 200 years or so is we've codified a lot of the processes that we that has been that have been operating alongside many other processes and we've selected them out and said these are the ones that we want to prioritize um but you know th- this idea that we we need falsifiable claims and so on it's i mean it's obviously important in some sense like you need because you need to work with things that are otherwise you're not doing anything i mean you're just uh, imagining a philosophies in your mind and you're dreaming up different yeah theories. i think like uh, falsifi- falsifiability gives us the ability to you know like it is actionable with respect to producing new truths otherwise you wouldn't be able to do that you would be like kind of stuck i mean you would be building upon something but you wouldn't necessarily localize onto a common value over yeah. time in 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 the sense of actionability mm. over it yeah. so this is a quite a systems view of science in general mm. uh because we're we're thinking about processes here like we're not thinking about oh, okay explanation about the internal logic of uh, various um same assumptions propositions in science yeah because what falsifiability is not that has to do explicitly with explanation and the, and basically scientific propositions um i mean uh, the, I, I, but, I, I, yeah. i don't know i mean i i i i understand that it, it does give that sort of theoretical angle but i would claim that falsifiability was implicit in the way for example cathedrals were built in europe right they didn't have a theory of statics they didn't have a theory of mechanics they didn't have any any way of subliming their their knowledge into a into a set of equations or set of, of maps in a in a or plans in in a, in a piece of paper but nonetheless they made progress and they made huge progress right from just like stacking stones to like making these beautiful things so i would say that the fa- the falsifiability mechanism was then just the fact that things didn't fall right like okay this this holds up okay fine then we we yeah. move on this particular method doesn't doesn't yeah. hold you know there's the fancy part so it's almost bringing that sort of weight of reality into the realm of ideas in some sense right it's like uh, it's i don't want to say it's more, much more than that i might be confused but i don't think it's much more than that okay yeah, yeah, I, I, i'm trying to like uh, sorry i i wanted to like um, ask for this like because um to me that like the idea of falsifiability was not a theoretical one but but rather an actual result of experimentation with uh variables that you can operate on and observe so uh, actually like the the idea of it being purely theoretical goes against the the idea of experiment i think because you can if it's only theoretical then it's it's just philosophy isn't it and so like i wanted to like uh ask you what um what what part of science or what uh cuz you mentioned kun and uh, so so I'm, i'm curious about what what do you mean by uh something's not being falsifiable in science and uh, in what sense are we not falsifying these things so, so here i think is very uh good to make some distinctions because um uh between um the you know be, between science as a, a, a set of propositions about the world and science as um 
you know, a material process that has effects on the world. Mm -hmm. This is very different. Yeah. Uh, and falsifiability is a notion that has to do, like at, at least the way it has been conceived, about statements, about logical statements. Uh, so I think the notion of falsifiability might not be the best one to talk to about, like, you know, when you, Carlos, were, were, when you said about, okay, in building cathedrals, this is also part of the process, you know, that things are not falling down, this is the criteria of falsifiability. I want to say this is falsifiability because there's no claim that it's being falsified because the, the process is very different. Like when you're, uh, when you're like building the cathedral and actually seeing, um, uh, trying to make structures that, uh, that work and, you know, a column just doesn't work and, and falls and you have to build it again. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about falsifying the claim that this specific column in this specific point in time is rigid and will hold. It is, a, it is a process that is way more direct, you know, the, the statements doesn't need to be there. So it is more like um, kind of a, a feedback loop with yeah. the material, you know, with what is happening right. and being open to a process of empirically assessing uh, something uh, and basically updating knowledge. But I think this is, you can either uh, do it in a purely... In, in, the, in, the, in the realm of theory, or you can do it in the realm of uh, tacit knowledge. And these are two different modes. It's, it's almost but, like the distinction between Kahneman's thinking fast and slow in a way, you know. But um, I mean, don't you, I, I, mean I, I see what you're saying, but don't, don't you agree that the process of uh, falsifiability as a, as a mechanism that mostly uh, predicates on theories, right? Mostly predicates on what the models of the world are and the different proposals of theories and, and um, paradigms or whatever. Wouldn't you agree that at the end of the day, what's happening is some abstract version of the, of the cathedral, cathedral building process? Because, I mean, you cannot falsify a theory in science without experiment. I mean, this is just impossible. So there is no there's no sense in which a theory falsifies another, another theory that, that that cannot happen, right? Um, so at least not not in the not in the sense in which we mean by scientific falsification, right? I mean it it has to be experimental, like that that that's that's the only way in which you can do it, right? Ah, okay, I I understand what you mean, but then okay, so when an experiment happens though, uh, you will have to codify its results Absolutely. into language and into statements, right? Absolutely. Yes, and absolutely. this is a process that you, you have to go through to produce science. Like you cannot just do a paper now and say like, okay, I've done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it has to be codified in language that can be transmitted. So, and you have to make some certain statements and then statements from the experiments that flow directly through them yes. can, can, can uh, enter in a process where they can uh, uh, be contradictory with previous statements or not. Yeah. So falsifiability then happens again at the level of uh, of um, you know theory. I agree. Uh, and uh, I agree. propositions. Yes. I even agree. though it yeah. is based, even though the propositions themselves can be updated based on um, you know material uh, interactions, yes. knowledge, observable, uh, perceivable facts that happen throughout the experimental process. Uh, exactly. Is this more clear? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I I agree on that, but. My my claim would be that in the in the analogy with the cathedral building, um, your the analog of a of a theory in that context might be a plan, right? Like they have a plan, they draw it, or you know they have some they have a design of an arch in that plan, and they have two different shapes, right? They go they go out there, they build them. One falls and the other doesn't. Like obviously, the only language they need is the direct experience of we seeing the rocks on the on the floor or not. Like it just that's that's the direct verification they have instead of translating that experiment into some codified theory rich uh, kind of language that then is going to be logically implemented and seen in in some formal context there they would just contrast and they look at this diagram and this other diagram on the piece of paper and they would say this one fell this one didn't so i would still claim that at that very rudimentary level the analog of the theory is the plans right like you you have some kind of representation or communicational uh, device that that serves humans that they don't have to build the arch again, right? They don't have to go and build the arch every time. 
because they didn't build cathedrals every time they tried new things. They imagined, they they sketched, they they did models at smaller scales and things like that, right? So they they had the, this whole process. I would claim that that is essentially analogous to what's happening with science. It's just that we have a much higher tower of formal systems, linguistic, formal, symbolic, uh, logical systems that we that we rely on. I agree with you that the falsification happens at a theoretical at a, at the theoretical layer. I completely agree with that. But what I'm saying is that the sort of um, um, motive force that that um, that enables falsification, like what, what gives a direction in the in the realm of in the realm of formal, formalism, is this experimental uh, is the, exp the experimental input, right? Um, it's similar to exploration, right? I mean, we fixate a lot on falsifiability because it's the thing that seems to be the most secure to make progress. But there are many times where exploration might also be a, a good way to make progress, meaning, you know, you, 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 you find some results, those results don't contradict anything, but they point at other things. And then you therefore go and look for, for those other results, right? So you might be thinking just theoretically, because I have these results, this, these hint at extensions of the theory. I don't have the verification, the experimental verification of the theory yet, but I make it because I have input, experimental input of that. Right? It's, it's kind of this, this kind of uh, um, reference or, or feedback loop, right? Um, like, uh, so I was thinking like with respect to the sequentiality of unfalsifiability and falsifiability in relation to human history, as in why would we have the concept of or practice of falsifiability later upon in time? So for, I, I thought of an example. So uh, it relates to our ability to exercise falsifiability and how it might lead to uh, uh, how the information is created. So if, if I live in a uh, uh, city offshore, so there are a lot of pipes and I'm in like 10,000 BC, and, so, and I have to predict or want to predict, you know, like, or want to know, let, let's uh, forget prediction, but want to know why these tides happen. So at that point in time, I, I can just suggest some cause, some arbitrary cause, and we label that cause some god of water. And I say, oh, this this does it based on some, some things. So based on the premise, this is unfalsifiable because the concept of the cord itself is abstract and shouldn't be testable by definition. And another guy, even in that time, say in 10,000 BC, the same timeline can say, oh, this is because of the moon. And they'd be like, okay, why would that? I mean, technically that is falsifiable, right? Like you could go to the moon or maybe do something with that object because it is defined in 3D space. But at that point in time, they cannot exercise that faculty of falsifiability. So to them, both of these explanations, they would take the one that is more, that is seemingly more sensible to them. But right, like at our point in time, we have enough body of knowledge, as Carlos said, that if I present an unfalsifiable claim, there are perhaps 10 or 20 more better suited claims that would lead to some actual result based on the existing body of knowledge, wherein I can exercise this faculty of falsifiability. So I think like it is the relevance or the value of method in relation to each other. So as we have built upon this this logical system and experimental based approach over the period of time, the balance of usefulness may have shifted from unfalsifiability to falsifiability as you know, like the localizers get more and more like like the network effect, right? Like you cannot make useful information unless you abide by the existing network, so to speak. Can I answer very quickly to your written question on the screen? It says, uh, what makes architecture different from, to science then? I would say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that's that's interesting then. Uh, because, you know, then we're stumbling across the, okay, uh, are we, like, is this a... a is this a framework that we're using that leads to explosion and then oh, would lead to the, oh, um, this is also science and this is science then and because it has the same process, so everything is science, so nothing is science, uh, yeah, which I don't think is... I don't think, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I think and connecting to what James was saying in, in the chat as well, uh, and, and this comment was made a while ago about, I think Anmol said that, you know things like beauty and so on maybe are not amenable or are not easily captured and so on i i honestly don't think that there is a there is a i mean there are cultural 
perceptions and sort of uh, conventions of what scientific uh, knowledge is typically about or what things can be well captured by figures and, or, or mathematics, arithmetical things or whatnot. Um, I really don't have a view that there's such a, I mean, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we, we are at SAMP here, right? So uh, if, if we are here, it's precisely mm-hmm. because many of mm-hmm. us don't have the view that there is a stark division between these things. So um, I'm right. not trying to say that everything is science. I think science, but I think science is a property of a communicational system. I don't think it really, um, it, you can judge whether a process is more or less scientific. But I don't think there's such a thing as a, you know, now we are enacting science, now we are not enacting science, or I am being more or less scientific right now in this time of my life, you know. And, you know, I wouldn't mm. I wouldn't say that's very useful. I say I would say that what's useful is to note that I mean, for example, many animals uh, engage in proto science or or primitive science in some sense, right? Like many social animals uh, have have this idea of a proto science, which I mean you can see it's the it's the beginning of this idea of a code or a representation that is communicational, that is distributed, that requires some dramatic reduction of, of experiential information into commun- communicable packet packlets that can be shared and can be sort of encoded and so on. So y- you see that, I mean, you see that everywhere. You see that in technology, you see systems that are, you know, in little uh, like uh, automata and bots and things like that in labs and, and so on. Like you see this, uh, this idea of, and at the end of the day, I think that's, by the way, what neural networks, both artificial and natural, are doing, right? Like, the, you have this idea of the collective uh, interactions and so on. So, to me, science is is simply the manifestation of that kind of process at the level of a cultural civilization or, or, or even a cultural community. It doesn't have to be a scale of a civilization, right? So, so you can... You know, if you go on and you you, you lose your you, you lose yourself in an exploration of a of musical improvisation, or you go swim in the sea or something, that's not science. I wouldn't say there's science a scientific process going on there. But if you if you are trying to collaborate with another group of humans and you have a, a binding uh, you have binding matter somehow, right? Like you have binding uh, living space or objects or tools or a cathedral to build or a, you know a particle blip to detect in a, in whatever in a calorimeter in the LHC whatever it is like if you're engaged in that process I think the scientific the scientific mechanism is going to emerge and and you know you can claim that something is more or less efficient you can claim that there's more or less efficient ways of, of manifesting it but I would I would assign the scientificness to a process enacted by cognitive agents in particular humans and not necessarily, so much about different cultural traditions. I mean, and you can do science about anything. You can really, I mean, it, it's not, there's no limit on, you know, you, 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 we can all take same, uh, same or different substances and try to create theories about what they elicit in our minds and whatnot. Like, and this is what people have done for, for, for many years, right? And I don't think, you know, any now seemingly bullshit, useless traditions of like psychology or whatever, um, those are very relevant. If you look at them in their in their slice of of, of time, right, and, and they are proper science in the slice that they correspond to, right. So, anyway, I I, I don't I don't I don't see that that stark distinction. And by the way, the more traditional um, scientific method proper that people normally refer to, the ones that get taught in schools, you know, with steps or whatever, and you know, form a hypothesis and all that kind of stuff. To me, that's just a very um, refined version of, of a particular way in which you can manifest this this mechanism, but it's by no means any kind of like dogma right. or kind of, some kind of rigid right. thing that can can be changed. It's, it's more like, mm. oh, you want to really go efficiently manifesting this process, then do this. But it doesn't mean that anything that does not conform to that is not manifesting that that feature, right? Obviously, there are many things that are not going to manifest that feature at all, and many that can be deceiving because people might think that they are manifesting that feature, but actually. It's not manifesting that scientific feature. And uh, that's, by the way, what we call pseudoscience. But the way we define pseudoscience is precisely when there is an implication that that aspect of, uh, of an informational communicational system is uh, being implied or is believed by the, the users or the enactors of, of that system. When actually, in actuality, when you go and check, it's, it's not there, right? That's what we call uh, pseudoscience. Yeah. It's only pseudoscience until it's not pseudoscience anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But James, you, you had your hand up for a while. 
Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, give me one second. So um, I'm gonna maybe just throw a, a spin in the at a, at a metaphysical angle here quickly, um, if you don't mind. It might get might get a bit weird, but uh, I'll just see what see what happens. Um, so here's, here's That's a, here's what we're a, here for. Exactly. <laughs> so okay. So, so here's my here's my theory about um, the the benefits of science. Um, so and I think it's I think it's tied to the the con the concept of formalization. I think the fact that science has hooked into some of these principles that are potentially very fundamental to existence, like to the degree that there's some process at a physical at a, at a physics level that is creating formalization, and the fact that science as a belief system has hooked into that gives it a lot more power than what a belief system that only hooks into a systems or a societal level um, has. Can you can you elaborate a little bit? Can you uh, explain? So when you say so, can you describe a little bit what you mean by creating formalization? Like how how like reality or yeah. physics? So or let's say um, like in science, there's a um, there's an observation, like even talking about like a quantum observation. So you collapse in a wave function based on a process. And um, that like brings something to be consistent with its environment. And to me, that process of creating consistency is a physics level uh, phenomena. And the fact that um, there's a societal process that is recreating that physics level phenomena means that there's confluence between that like the, the primary level at which uh, computation, let's say, is done. Um, and the way we think about stuff computationally uh, at a societal level. Okay. So, but that, that's somehow like always there, right? Like it, the, there's... Yeah, it's always there, but um, in, in other belief systems, um, the appreciation of formalism and uh, non-contradiction and those kind of things are not necessarily as, uh, as relevant. So it's, it's maybe like, think, think of it like, uh, I can maybe co contrast it with another belief system um, that tends to try to hook into like a, a physics level um, hypothesis and that's like accelerationism. Um, so if you, if you think about uh, accelerationism, if you go to like the manifesto, they're talking about the second law of thermodynamics and how um, this is an inevitable process based on the effects of gravity um, you know, constraining entropy, and because life emerges from this principle, furthering accelerationism, furthering this process of uh, creation of entropy in the universe is good, and that's what creates this motivation and some would argue effective growth of that belief system because it is harnessing in their belief a, a physical process, like a fundamentally physical process. Wait, I don't know what you're referring to as accelerationism here, and let's not get into it because it's a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> but for, as far as I know, acceleration is, is the exact opposite of that. All of this series has to do with negentropy, with a um, with a maximization of the, the 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 tendencies of systems to self-organize. So it's the exact opposite of that. So. I'm not sure exactly where he's yeah, it's, um, referring I mean, to. Th that's going to go into the system's argument. It's, it's you create negative entropy by pushing entropy into the environment. And 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 yeah, so it's universal entropy. Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, that, that's a whole different level. I was just using that as, as a basis to which to say that potentially, if you think of the scientific endeavor as a belief system, let's just, let's just define it as that for the time being, potentially its um, effectiveness has been because some of the foundations of the belief system are actually fundamental processes in the universe. Okay, so I will jump here by commenting on a comment by Elena and also answering James's uh, metaphysical spanner. <laughs> um, so, so Elena mentioned what about science versus technology? And, and again, uh, it's not that I'm trying to like really be on brand constantly at Sam and saying, oh yeah, forget about the divisions between science and technology, blah, blah, blah. But I honestly believe it's important to realize that that's, that distinction, I mean, you have to 
think a little bit about why you think science and technology are separate, right? I mean, obviously there are different words, okay, good, good start. Uh, but then when you, you try to go down to what technology is in some general sense or what science is in some general sense, you will find that, and by the way, art gets thrown in the mixture in the same way, you know, it's like at the end of the day, like you can really separate other than, you know, humans interacting with non-human elements and communicating with other humans and potentially collaborating around those non-human elements, right? So at the end of the day, I don't, again, when I said, when I mentioned this very broad definition of like science as a property of an informational system and things like that, it's because I, I honestly don't have an intuitive sense that there is a well-defined way to say, okay, this is a realm of science. You know, you can, you go to uh, the mountains and pick some rocks and you're doing geology and now you go to whatever, measure the humidity in the clouds and you're doing meteorology, like all these kinds of things. I mean, these are all coincidences and kind of the accidental histories of human cultures that are evolving in different directions. But in the essence of what's going on, what you can tell is whether uh, a, a, a an informational flow within among some agents is being more or less uh, distributed it is being more or less um, constrained by the, a verification process that relies on say something like a boolean state something like truth seeking by each individual that has an, an alignment something like goal directedness of a population or not like these are these are mostly sort of behavioral or informational dynamics that 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 sort of uh, display uh, uh, different aspects of, uh, of our informational system, right? So to me, that's what counts. And you would, as I said, you would find those patterns in all manner of uh, all manner of human activity and non-human activity as well. And, and so to me, the distinction, it's making a distinction for science is only really relevant at a political level, I would say, like in a societal sort of like, um, let's uh, let's organize our lives in a way that we all deem appropriate, and we, let's let's uh, lead the civilization in a direction that we're all, all more or less agreeable with, and so on. There is what I think science as a concept or a belief system or something makes more sense, because then you can say, well, let's uh, you know uh, banner uh, uh, around this, let's let's gather around these ideas, and let's say let's attribute values, moral value to these things, and let's sort of defend them and propose them and, and try to up, uphold them. But but other than that, in a, in a sort of uh, epistemologically honest way, you know, I can't really distinguish between art, technology, science in the process, right? Obviously, you, it, it distinguishes in the, in the motivations and the individual verification systems and the sort of goal-orientedness of the, of the whole and so on. But, but, that, but that's mm. kind of my point. And so um, even if I take your, your point, James, which I, I like the provocation, I like that, that you're suggesting, if I under, understood correctly, that this overall process in society is, is due to some fundamental dynamics of the universe. I mean, in some sense, it should be, right? Because otherwise, I don't know where well, else... It, 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 it leverages something fundamental. It, yeah. it might not be the process itself, but it's it's tapping into something uh, that is happening deeper deeper down. Yeah, it's like the system is never independent of the hardware at some types of processes. There's certain processes that are always going to be more efficient and more effective depending on which hardware layer you're operating on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like uh, as for the distinct, I agree that like science and technology at its core are not fundamentally distinct. Hmm. But uh, like immediately when I thought of the science and technology duality, I thought of pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Like that that kind of parallel was what I saw. Yeah. yeah. And it was with regards to uh, you could say optimization. Like which side do they lean to? So science, like when you say technology, there is an expectation I would be able to use it in some form or sense. But that isn't necessarily the case with scientific knowledge. Like not every scientific knowledge could be relevant with respect to its actionability aspect. That isn't to say that it wouldn't be actionable, but like I'm more inclined to believe that some technology would be actionable or almost most of it, as opposed to that characteristic being equally reflected in the realm of science. Yeah. Whereas uh, with respect to science, I expect some production of new fundamental knowledge more than I, what I expect from technology. So you could launch some maybe new AI tool that helps me organize my files on my desktop PC. You didn't break any uh, fundamental breakthroughs in 
uh, the like machine learning or something, but you did provide me a tool that works for my purposes. So, so from a technology perspective, that could be a breakthrough or that could be something that is very much impactful on a societal level. But from a scientific perspective, it could be rather mundane. Well, so I think like, yes, I, I, I agree. I agree. But I agree that there can be a distinction and there can be different realms or bands of, uh, or what is it, what is the word? Um, substrates for this information, the, the information dynamics. But to me, the, 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 the substrate is not that, that crucial. So you, you mentioned applied mathematics and pure mathematics. So there's certainly a, a distinction of, is your formalism referring to formalism or is your formalism directly or is your formalism directly referring to material, non-formal uh, elements of, of experience, right? For the user at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And you say that, you know, your, your uh, new AI tool might be practical to you and it might be more mundane or more uh, sort of pedestrian for theoretical point of view but and 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 you compare it by saying that uh, maybe the the theory is is just intended for its own sake and it's not actionable and so on i would disagree in the sense that the realm of applicability of a new model or new theory whatever you say new fundamental knowledge in a theoretical sense the realm of applicability is the abstract set of rules where that functions right so it, it it's not it's not the it's not the void of it's not, it doesn't in somehow it's not um, isolated and sort of pristine, floating like a crystal in in the vacuum, right? It's that's not what a yeah. that's not what a theory is. It, a theory, if it's fundamental and it's pro progressing something, it means that it latches onto many other existing theories and and in some kind of machine like fashion, it, it turns things in a way that is novel that did, didn't happen before. So obviously, it's different to say I just developed a new jet engine that just happens to make planes fly faster and more cheaply or whatever. But in, in some sense, a jet engine and a, and a new fundamental theory about whatever, monoids, like these two things have a mechanical, you know, almost a, a sort of systemic sort of connectivity pattern that, that is going to be uh, uh, interacting with, with the context that is built for, right? A, mono, a theory about monoids is going gonna, is gonna to latch onto a lot of existing sort of symbolic, formal, imagined theories in, 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 in human brains, and a jet engine is going to latch onto some like fuselage or something and then fly in the, in, in the sky or, or crash or not, right? Like, and so both the fact that one goes in, in, a, in the direction of this is going to be a lived imagination of humans or some AIs maybe in the future that think about it, or it goes into the hands of people to like work the land or fly in the sky or whatever, that to me that that's not a big difference it's clearly a difference and you can you there are features that are quite different between these two realms that you can make this broader sense of what is more formal science and what is more um applied science or material science that's why by the way we've always made this distinction in at SEMP. We've, we've always said formal sciences and uh maybe experimental sciences and things like that because there, there is mm. a there's an important distinction there but in terms of what qualifies the science and, and this idea of actionability and being it being useful for something and so on, I would claim that those are those are quite analogous in, in both cases, right? This idea that, oh, I'm making mathematics that will never be useful for something. If you really do that, then you're almost creating the empty mathematics, right? It's like... Okay, so, so I agree, like, there is a, like, the parameter for applicability would also be considered in the realms, realms of science. Like, there is an overlap, but... There is a clear, ex like there is at least a good deal of expectation that technology would sure. have that faculty. So th sure. that's why, like, we made those categories in the first place, right? And Absolutely. That, there, there's a, uh, you could see that's this reflected in the expectation of sequentiality. Like, I'm not saying like technology doesn't lead to new science, but like more often than not, you would expect science to lead to new technology, and that captures what. What, which kind of spirit they incline to. So I think so as long as this, you know, like this discrepancy is reflected, I would say those domains are inclined in those directions enough to make that distinction. Because if that's not the case, then th that kind of sequentiality should disappear in practice, or at least, you know, like there shouldn't be much difference. Like new technology should create equivalent to new science. But if it doesn't, then we can say that, okay, there's enough of a distinction in this parameter, which is reflected due to their optimizations. So I'd say that in that sense, you could maybe- Yeah, and um, just to go back on that concept of um, feelings, 
I guess maybe a better word to describe the the benefit that science has had on our feelings is through technology. So it's it's science to the, to the degree that it's helped us create technologies that has improved mm-hmm. our lives um, justifies uh, science. I guess that that was that was how that's connected over time. Like it's undeniable over the last few hundred years how much technology has influenced our lives for the better. And if you can attribute that to science, then clearly science is is, is winning in that regard. And yeah. here, mm-hmm. yeah, go this. no, no, go on, go on, Carlos. No, uh, I was just going to say that a different point I guess. that that uh, is if science, um, as opposed to when you say if technology has benefited from science, as opposed to say religious beliefs or particular spiritual traditions or things like that, because in that regard, I would not be making the strong division from technology and science. Because I think I think I know what Anmol is pointing at that you know traditionally new technologies have come from science, and I completely agree in some in some this historical sense like in fact i remember in in uh, amsterdam we were having this conversation i think Fodis was, was part of that conversation we talked about calculus and the you know the onset of the industrial revolution and machines and you know how how much the in differential calculus helped uh, the development of all that stuff um but at the same time i i can't buy feel like mathematics is just mental technology and it's it might sound weird to say that but and it might sound like metaphorical or poetic in some sense but it i mean the the process is indistinguishable from what you see in the in the in the realm of technology like in, in industry in some sense what you see in mathematics in pure mathematics the process is almost indistinguishable right like you you, you have a machine works or doesn't work for int- its intended purpose and and you know you can measure maybe efficiency but if you set goals of efficiency it's indistinguishable in, in that sense so Although there's there are important dif- dif- differences between between those between actual material technology and mental technology, one being mostly cost and opportunity, because obviously running mental technology is very very cheap. Because just, just imagine, um, I think that the processes are extremely analogous and, and extremely parallel. So anyway, good. Okay, so like uh, I think you are right. Like if in in that sense, like we can unify per definition. But that in practice, they seem to diverge in a meaningful sense. Yes, of course. And like I was thinking, like uh, in in terms of religion, like you can actually, I think you you could say like religion is more of a technology, in the sense that I I I, I tell you to practice this 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 and and then That's claim true. some result. Did you say? Did you say? You know, like, sorry, what did you say? Religion is what technology? It's a societal technology. Yeah, social yeah, technology, yeah, right? yeah exactly. because I engineer a framework that leads to you. Like, yeah. I mean, most people believe in religion because they want some outcome out of it, right? You, you don't. Uh, no, maybe not, but like that is an inherent aspect of it, at least. Like, I engineer a framework that optimizes for some outcome. Then I claim that outcome and say, do this, 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 believe this, or you know, do these activities, and this would lead to this goal. Yeah. So in that sense, that's at least an attempt at technology. But we know, like, religion isn't necessarily a science, but at least not its foundations. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a good distinction is, like, you could almost say that those two are juxtaposed. I would, I would disagree with juxtaposed. <laughs> well, with the, the best what you yeah, mean by juxtaposed is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You mean, you mean just side by side or opposite? Uh, like, what's the opposite of science? Let me, let me ask the question like that. Not well defined. <laughs> yeah. Undefined. 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 Yeah, yeah. I don't think I don't think that it, it's a meaningful oh. thing to ask. <laughs> I mean, no criticism to your question, but it's a mini- it's a meaningful question, but it has no meaningful answer. <laughs> mm, I think it might say you know, like we were talking about pseudoscience. So I mean, can I practice pseudo- pseudoscience? Uh, it seems like the there is no foundation, like it's unbounded. I can do pretty much anything because now there's no seemingly, lo- like there doesn't seem to be any localizer that makes me reliably choose among multiple options. So then it becomes, you know, of value to think like what kind of things systemically do people end up localizing on amongst multiple pseudosciences? And, and like when pseudosciences contradict, what faculty allows them to you know, localize on a particular pseudoscience and not the other. 
and perhaps in the at some point in the future it turns out like there was some useful information that can be extracted not at that point in time but at some later point in time then i think you could look at the past and then see that what we couldn't capture by the means that we had at that point in time what factors led to this localization of that particular pseudoscience and not the other and then that could feed into so 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 i so i see it as a study of non possibilities so what is what is, is not it? possible now from like the bas- that basket i could study this basket at a later point in time if something useful comes out of it i mean that's an interesting point to raise there is like you could have conflicting pseudosciences but i don't think you could i don't think the statement that conflicting there, there is conflicting science maybe in the way that science is used it's almost used as like a a belief system like in order to be scientific you need to believe that there is science that it exists as like a thing that's either scientific or it's, or it's unscientific so that that's an interesting concept is like what happens when when science disagrees like is that even possible by the definition of how we think of science i think maybe if you change the primitives that you are working with i think uh, i'm not sure like if would uh discussing the similarities or differences <laughs> but to me religion and science seem, seem uh, fundamentally different in the in the, their principles because uh the, relig- the the principles of religion at least uh, the the religions i've been uh, exposed to are assumed to be true and uh, necessarily true uh, even if uh tested so like even if a given test shows that a given statement is wrong uh religion will reify will modify uh, the in, in essence it, it will make things so that the uh, the the statements of religion will be true no matter what but mm. science uh, doesn't work that way or it shouldn't work that way <laughs> at least in principle yeah. the, the thing is that a, a given statement in science should be uh tested then it's either false true or whatever uh but not m- modified into oh no it's true but you haven't tested it properly because you know it, it's behind all of this you actually got this wrong and you see you know you you see this kind of behavior uh which i, I consider religious behavior in uh this uh you know in um, in flat earthers so you you see that they 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 actually are very uh, interested interesting people in the sense that they they many of them try to keep making this this uh experiments and you've seen you've seen these these people actually getting like um into a, a lot of research of what what kind of machinery they could do to test this or that there's actually a good documentary on this and it's it's yeah. and it's very funny because they keep proving themselves wrong but it's it, they still say that the earth is flat and the experiment was wrong because of some mm. absurd reason so why did you perform that experiment in the first place okay i love, I love the <laughs> yeah danny i love the example and i'm going to say i'm going to say something i don't know if this is it's going to sound very controversial i think but it actually <laughs> I know it's okay. it, it it actually reflects how i think about this and it n- n- neatly ties min- many different themes that we've said today I would say now that science versus religion on on the screen, right? So contrast between science and religion. My claim would be that the difference between the fundamental difference between science and religion is that religion speaks about truth and science doesn't. <laughs> that that wow. would be my claim. That would I'm be really my claim. happy with that. Actually, I'm, I'm really I'm really satisfied with that. <laughs> Actually, I think like. Uh, it's not controversial to me at all. Okay, <laughs> we have to we have to define like we're going back yeah. to truth now. Yeah, no, I think I, I think like uh, with religion, like it at any point in time, it it tries to accommodate it all. Like you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. at this point in time, it would modify just enough mm. so that it can accommodate all knowledge up until this point in time. But science doesn't necessarily want to accomplish that. So I think you like think religion I, actually, tries to unify under a single umbrella. like at at, at all cost so it doesn't necessarily emphasize other elements in, in that sense but science uh uh-huh. i i th- actually feel it's the opposite in the sense of okay so you can you, you can have you can have also religious behavior in in scientists and people can talk about scientific facts in a religious way 
but I, to me it feels that science is actually more integrative in the sense of uh it doesn't necessarily negate uh religion but rather it puts it in the position that it should be it actually explains the mechanisms that make it work and function within society within culture and so on so in that sense i think science actually makes sense of all of these contra- apparently contradictory things in 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 life but religion rather i think uh if it works as an umbrella which it necessarily doesn't always work as an umbrella i think it works an umbrella in those cases where the differences are actually ignored where actually the the difference between uh opposing forces is rather ignored and said oh no but in the end you know it's actually all this you know i've seen this like i've, I've talked with um uh you know religious people saying oh well you know but actually all religions are the same they all believe in god in some sense so it, it kind of uh, um of course not, maybe maybe like a person you know like uh, a buddhist of course wouldn't agree with that a buddhist are, are not a theists uh but you know maybe a catholic of this sort uh would say oh no but you know actually through their practice they're actually honoring god and in a sense you know their beliefs actually represent higher uh you know monotheistic idea blah 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 and so on but they, this is only true because they're ignoring but we can we can say this is true only if we ignore the actual differences between Buddhism and uh, you know being Catholic, being whatever Jew or whatever. So uh, I think if if anything, I think religion actually uh, works as an umbrella when it actually ignores all the differences and it's just not saying really anything about uh, you know it's, it's kind of like um, in a sense it's kind of like erasing all differences to yeah. make everything seem as it's just I, I think thing. like in that sense science and religion can be said as polar opposites in this approach in the sense that religion religion tries to find meaning in whatever it can like it, it tries to find the common thread as as much as it can and doesn't necessarily use the currency of making sense all over the place as as you mentioned right there are differences but they ignore the I, or they will just come up with the new definition or a more accommodative definition of God or why it might be different amongst religions. So they try to find a common thread as far as they can. It, so that's what the unifying aspect of it uh, I was referring to by science. It tries to look for discrepancies and remove them as far as it can to arrive at a truth. Yeah, so, but so in that sense... Time, can... Yeah, sorry for this. So like science seek for, seeks for flaws while religion tries to be as perfect as possible even if there is a little possibility of it and well, then, and then, i think yeah. this uh, uh yeah i will just say something really fast and, I, and i'm done um because this is actually what we're talking about now is, is just making me think of this uh book i'm reading i shared this and on discord um and it's, it's really interesting um because it, it compares to different let's say drives because it, it it basically the the book discusses um truth as some as a something that uh, the will to truth and the will to ignorance as something that happens to us as organic beings and it kind of tries to make sense of um trying to, the will to become ignorant and the will to ignore things uh in in the in a biological sense why would it be interesting for someone to ignore things and um I think um I think basically the difference between the will to ignorance and the will to knowledge is basically the difference we're talking about here. So uh you want to ignore things because that's going to basically preserve uh the status of a given belief of a given uh model of the world or even your mental health for example so you would you obviously would try to um, you know make whatever belief you you have in your mind as uh, you know as stable as possible cuz actually you know kind of like uh, putting your belief against other other beliefs in you know it, it, it's kind of leading you to become a bit mentally stable it's it's uh, difficult it's it's hard for you, for people to digest um uh, many different uh ideas so it's better it's more easy and more energetically stable to just assume well this is 
the truth and I just follow it and that's it. And so it makes sense as a self-preservation mechanism. Um, but, um, and in that sense, I, I associate this with uh, religious, pra religious practice in the sense of, well, you're ignoring things, you just want this to, things to be stable for a self-preservation purpose. And um, and then I, I, I associate this with the truth to science in the sense of you're, you're constantly putting things together against each other, you're testing them and you're putting them in order, you're coordinating them and you're making some sense of them. I think that uh, what is he what is happening here is that we're trying to find to compare science and religion through a cognitive lens. I think we're like trying to see religion through the uh, in the same way that we would view science, and I think that we have to start from a very different standpoint because their goals are not the same. You know, it is not like uh, science is like I, um explicitly cognitive or epistemic goals while well, religion doesn't and if we try, try to even if, if we can do this kind of like uh, explaining religion in in relation to science in terms of like oh the energetic cost of having certain beliefs and blah blah and what it takes to uh, account for discrepancies okay we can do that but in the end um um I think that their fundamental distinction has to do both in their function and in the like um, a mode of approaching it. Where religion, you um, you can approach in very ways. Actually, you can approach religious in a very like rigorous manner, in a very like something very methodical that you would in the same way that you would do with science. Like uh, Catholicism is definitely that in terms of its theology. Uh, but then there's the as there's, there's aspects of religion as belief, there's aspects of religion as uh, uh, an integrative. No, this this you know it is. Um, you would use a different mode uh, of approaching the world to go to either like, um, yeah. and maybe like uh, uh, the, um confusions can arise when we see the same through the same lens and this is why like i added like this thing here like toes like theories of everything because it seems to me that if we say okay if we go back to this what we said about like religion being like having to do with truth and science and this kind of totality of truth and science not having to do with and being this more like you know this process that can account for discrepancies then theories of everything are basically uh the religious uh, um, stance uh, seeping into science itself, like this need to have this fully integrative uh, framework through which to view the whole. Yeah, and and to build to build on your on that very last comment, for this uh, I wanted to answer to something that Anmol said when you described that oh religion actually goes goes out of its way to justify how the, the same thing keeps being true and so on. So if you look at theoretical physics for the last hundred years, that's effectively what we've been doing. I mean, that's that's essentially the modus operandi, operandi that we have decided is the most effective because, and this is some cosmic prank that we are under, <laughs> it so happened that the, the models that we discovered early in the 20th century were unreasonably effective. And it's incredibly effective that we, f we have those models. So what we have been doing, and by the way, complexity science is largely also that narrative where, oh, these scaling laws and these network effects here, it doesn't matter what you're measuring, it's the same thing, right? It, it, I mean, if you squint a little bit, you will see that <laughs> right. oh, that's almost like a gospel that is being reinterpreted over and over again, you know, like, so... So it's not so dissimilar in the social dynamics. So I completely agree with both. Is the, the distinguishing factor is indeed the the motivation and the sort of the kind of mode in which you engage with it. And I would say that the, the distinction is that science is indeed more uh, epist epistemic, more cognitive, and so on. And religion tends to be more spiritual, right? And and to me, I mean, you can be spiritual with fully scientific uh, mindset, but and be be non dogmatic about it. But being spiritual to me means that you are sort of reveling in this condition of being awake and being alive and being conscious and 
and you know having thoughts and memories and so on so that you can really escape the very thing that allows you to operate in this kind of environment that we are interacting uh, at now um but religion typically has been a system to to sort of manage or i don't know articulate that mode of, of experience and and i mean i mean you mentioned catholicism i am familiar with catholicism my family i mean it's, it's easter now and my family just came back from their catholic thing here in, in in my hometown um and and it's funny because my parents are they, they are self-proclaimed catholics i myself uh, i consider myself atheist i mean I, I don't need any god in this in this more metaphysical sense but they claim themselves to be catholic and it's interesting that they are the most rational analytical people i basically know in my in my immediate uh, sphere of, of of society right and but they are nonetheless claiming that yeah whatever the gospel says and whatever the bible says it articulates very well their spiritual life right like the, the way they think about their you know life in general and moral values and the, what humans ought to be doing and what is good and what is bad and all those things they 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 think that it's very well reflected by the theory of whatever they have in mind, which, by the way, is quite different from standard religion because uh, Catholicism, because it's very sort of left-leaning sort of theology of liberation kind of thing, infused kind of stuff. But the point is that they would claim that and they would have no problem um, sort of attaching to a religion, religious tradition. And nonetheless, you know, my father's an engineer and my mother's a doctor and they, 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 they're just the most rational people you've ever come across, right? So I, I think that I mean, I've always opposed religion because of the or Catholicism because of the more factual consequences of the dogma that it carries, right? Like I've, I've always seen more harm than good in you know, on average, right? But it is also very clear that you can be the utmost uh, Catholic person or or God fearing person and still still be the greatest mathematician or scientist in the history of humanity, right? These things are not are not conflicted directly, right? So I think, and that's why I mentioned that when we think of science as a subject and we attribute it a name and we give it identity and so on i think it's more in this realm of discussion that that, that is societal that is political that is about what kinds of values do we want to organize ourselves around right i mean we didn't begin this society or any other of our particular personal endeavors uh, around notions of let's keep on going with these scriptures from 2000 years ago or 5000 years ago or something like i just find that to be quite silly because whatever i mean these are just scriptures from then and yeah they might be very wise and make capture some very fundamental aspects of humanity and so on it's undeniable but it doesn't seem proper to me to like disregard the present and disregard what we have now and try to build more constructively and more directly with that but that's just the way my way of doing it and i know it's not coming into conflict with someone else who might have more metaphysically different motivations or might have a different framing as long as we're not competing in, in the, you know when, when the scientific the scientific nature of our interaction is present i don't care if you go to bed thinking that you are living on the top of a tortoise and like well, I, I, it really does not matter to me what the belief system that you are picturing in your head is as long as we are agreeing that the informational uh, sort of game that we're playing is the game that we should be playing and we can make progress and so on. That, that to me is the mm. basis for civilization building, right? And especially in a time when there are so many divisions, because by the way, we're we are talking about religion here as this caric- almost caricatures of like old uh, Abrahamic religions or, or Buddhism or things like that, or, or you know, in India and the many traditions there are. But in my opinion, the more dangerous religions are the ones that are kind of alive and well today that are not usually branded as religions, which are all these sort of political movements, they're economic, political, they have all these sort of multifaceted ways. And yeah, people just operate religiously within those, right? So it's those are the ones that are tricky to deal with because you, you can't really like yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Yeah, but by the way you mentioned like cosmic prank, right? So I was yes. thinking, you know, like anything that we do, religion, science, so like so much is riding on our brain being a com- perfect computer, like or, or like it being represent, like it it being a one to one part of reality, so to speak. Right. Because, yeah. Because every truth or every value that has ever been derived or verified is by a human in our reality. So yeah. we do not know of those in, that information from POV that is not human. Yeah, I, I agree with that because it feels to me that 
So everything we uh, know and, and can think of is pretty much, okay, it's just uh, pretty much something we evolved to have. And, you know, we have the perception of, of objects being, uh, you know, having some sort of stability and the uh, same thing with uh, ourselves and so on, because we can detect the borders of objects and when they can separate uh, the figure from the background and so on. We have all these uh, gestaltic and, and among other, uh, let's say, evolutionary prejudices, which are very useful. And um, we th these are completely untestable. This is, these are pretty much fictions that we have developed evolutionarily. And so it makes, to me, it makes no sense to like uh, say how, like talk about how unreasonable, uh, unreasonably effective our um, sciences or our brain is or whatever, because it, it's pretty much the only thing we have. We cannot compare it to anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're basically basing, we're basically confirming ourselves uh, all the time with our own prejudices based on. Well, just what we are organically and what we are capable of doing. So, I, I would say we're, we're rather just fairly reasonably <laughs> good at uh, making things for the purposes that we are uh, actually, yeah, always projecting, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think I, you are right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like everything we do, like we know that there is this backdrop of, you know, like assumed backdrop of human body and mind that which we cannot escape, at least as of now. And yet that is all that we do know. So like, it's, so we cannot uh, assume that there are other perspectives or like test for them at the same time. So we have to operate under the assumption that this is at least, you know, like useful for or the two things that we'll ever come to would at least be useful for humanity at last. So I think like that backdrop in that sense becomes invisible because yeah, it, it, it's irrelevant unless it becomes testable, so to speak. Yeah, I think I think the, this uh, shifts the discussion from truth to utility rather. Mm -hmm. So okay, we don't, it's not that there are, well things that are true true in it in themselves like beyond like metaphysically. So they just uh, these are just pragmatically useful. Uh, they, they're just uh, they're just evolutionary or historical reasons for us to believe these things, and they and these things as a consequence have uh, certain effects which we can try to understand using our other um, cognitive systems. By the way, like I was thinking, uh, other thing, like I was thinking that you mentioned like having, you know, like ignorance. So I was thinking like, does the capacity to have false, known false beliefs or uh, have ignorance allow us to accomplish something useful? So in that sense, like I was thinking of an experiment. Uh, I I'm thinking something more like consequential, but uh, I, I think maybe we can abstract it from this one. So uh, let's say there is a thin plank, say 0.75 feet wide that you have to walk on and it's kept in a room that is one feet high. No, I mean the plank is one feet high from the ground and you are told to walk on it as fast as possible. You do that and in another experiment, suppose you have a projection of that plank being situated on top of two very tall buildings and there's wind all over the place. But that is not actually the case. So, so I mean, we cannot really conduct that experiment, but let us assume that the, that the participant doesn't know that that isn't reality, that's just a projection. And you are again told to walk as fast as possible on, to, in, on that plank. So now, because you do know, I mean, from your perspective, you know that it is on top of two very tall buildings. And if you fall, you fall to your death. Your max speed would be limited by being exposed to this information, which you otherwise wouldn't have been. Or at least like if you repeat like this experiment 10 times, that would be the average, or at least we have an expectation for that to be slow and more careful. And even it might actually lead to more number of accidents due to the, you know, uh, uh, emotion of fear that might be resulted from that exposure to information. And you could say that for reverse, you know, like it could be actually there are two tall buildings and you are set to walk on it, but you, the projection is that it is one feet off the ground. So that changes your result for the better, even though that belief is false. Yeah, yeah, that's why that's why I associate this uh, this uh, ignorance part, this will to ignorance, to 
uh, self-preservation. Because I, I feel I feel it's it's kind of like okay, this, actually having these knowledge is not helping you in any way, and it's actually hurting you in some sense. Well, yeah. in the in your example, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's hurting you. Uh, it might kill you, but uh, but in other cases, it might just be that well, you cannot actually deal with it it's gonna affect your mental health or it's gonna make you like dysfunctional in some sense it's gonna like hurt you or cause you pain in some way and and i I, i'm not saying that we should necessarily strive for always constantly for truth because sometimes ignoring certain things is actually useful for our survival for our for our energy for our time um but i'm just mostly uh, kind of uh, putting the uh, making explicit the the usefulness rather of uh, the different approaches. I'm not saying that uh, necessarily being religious in in some moment in time is going to be bad. Uh, so much as being religious uh, in a scientific environment when you're supposed to try to get knowledge uh, and make new knowledge, it might be detrimental in that context. I, I think that's that that goes to a very fundamental like notion like this goes to very fundamentally in epistemology like what kind of um scientific pra- what kind of practice in general you can have when you don't assume that all you have to do is just gain new knowledge uh mm-hmm. or and what is the function of knowledge in the system because I don't, this is something that goes like into, you know, the way that experimental designs are shaped. Like for example, like you um, said, like have this like a thought experiment, but this thought experiment actually is very relevant for experiments in behavioral science, in neuroscience, in yeah. cognitive psychology, where you have individuals and you make a lot of assumptions or put them in a very controlled environment where you cannot ba- basically assess in in such a way the function of knowledge of the setting itself uh and, and this is also where you where you know uh very practically um we use placebo in pharmacology to uh, act as a control although uh there might be effects associated with a placebo for uh, that we cannot account for. For example, um, a lot of placebos that are used uh, sometimes are, um, for example, my, my, what I'm thinking of is in psychedelic research is niacin, vitamin B3, but niacin can have very strong effects to some individuals. Like it can have your like blood, like... Uh, um, rushing through your face, like it, in, it in, increases uh, neuro uh, dias, how do you call it? Neuro dias, the neuro diastaltic effects. Uh, I mean, for any reason, this can cause something very close to uh, a, a, an altered state of consciousness just by measure of this acting in certain way to a certain individual. And then when belief comes into place, uh, it may reinforce that, and we don't have an account. We don't have like a very good way of accounting for that effect. It is almost as if um, the beliefs, the knowledge that participants have in experiments, has nothing to do with the outcome, uh, and that is an assumption that we're not questioning. I don't know if this is very clear. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can you can you like rephrase it? Um, let me see if we can have a better example. Like basically, um, um, there are effects that are. Um, it's not easy to phrase it in a very simple way. Maybe um, the the best example would be the notion of um, self fulfilling prophecy. Oh, actually, I'm saying something along the lines. 
so you're saying like the expectation of something happening actually causes it to happen um, or it creates the context in which you are trying to, uh, or which you're operating and you're constructing the whole uh, framework, the whole experimental framework for this to happen. But n n no, 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 that was not what I was. Um, yeah, let, 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 let's keep this aside. This, uh, uh, yeah, I, think I have to better phrase this. Yeah, w w there's, plenty, there's plenty of time to to crystallize thoughts um, in writing. And I think it's a, it's a good point to maybe come to a close, which has been running for some time, um, and it's getting later over here, so I'll have to go, unfortunately, because I'm really enjoying this conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we should do it again. We definitely, the limits of science need to be featured again in the bi-weekly theme, and <laughs> this, is, this is clear to me now. Um, so if you, if you all have some final thoughts or reflections that you want to share uh, with us, um, Please go ahead and we can do the final round before we close. Yeah, do you need science to study limits of science? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, this is I agree. Fun, right? Yeah, it, it, we do. We, it, <laughs> 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 the limits of make science. Us of science. I mean, this yeah. is what has been happening with open science, with reproducibility crisis, with meta science, with the research on research, yeah. with neurology, with cognitive science on science. This, this exact sociology of science, you know, this is science reflecting on science itself, but from yeah. a different perspective. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. I mean, science is, is is something happening in the physical world, in in in, in the context of society, of culture, and so on, and th these things are. I have things you can actually study, so why actually not study it, right? No, of course. I mean, you just take the scientific community, split it in half, and then have each half study each other. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how you they find to the dead. Each, and... each, of them defines, <laughs> each of them defines Maybe. their universe as, you know, the others, and they are just part of the universe. They study yeah. it as a phenomenon in the universe. And... What yeah, it's like them fight. It's, it's like this. Uh, by saying like science studies the limits of science, it's so meta, and yet the most difficult problem might be like the hard problem of consciousness that we have to solve. That's like sort of meta in the sense of systems pr perspective uh, as a level of organization. So yeah. Yep. All right, peeps. Um, it was a pleasure. It's been a real privilege as always to discuss with you all. Um, if uh, I don't have access to the chat, but maybe Alvaro is still listening. It's uh, been uh, dutifully um, monitoring the chat and very unfortunately not joining. It's, uh, he had many things to contribute. Unfortunately, he wasn't wasn't able to join. Um, uh, you can share the link to the um, to the community. Um, you can join these calls. We, this is open to everyone. Um, many more things to come. Uh, so. I think we're gonna close the live stream right now. So thanks for um, watching, and you know, follow us on our social media, etc. And we'll see you all soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.